everybody, it's Mark Thompson, and this is the Chief Executive Summit, and we're talking with Bill McNabb for the CEO Academy about an extraordinary career that he's had and the impact that he's had on the investment process. I mean, under his leadership at Vanguard, the, the company has grown to customer assets under management of over $5 trillion. I've been a longtime admirer, and it's been life-changing for me and anyone else who realized early on that it was about the index. It was about being involved and engaged in equities and uh, maybe not getting into all of the politics and the patronizing uh, confusion that we hear about active management. And one of the areas that I wanted to focus on today, Bill, and so thank you so much for being here today. Um, I wanted to ask you about this idea of shareholders and stakeholders. Uh, one of the comments you make in the book is how surprised you are and how there seems to be this kind of zero sum game between the two. Could you talk about that? Sure, well, thanks Mark and thanks for having me and uh, thanks for the comments about uh, Vanguard and indexing. Um, <laughs> you know, I was very lucky to, I joined Vanguard um, three years out of business school, it was a complete accident and I had 32 amazing years there. So it's uh, you know sometimes better to be lucky than smart. You know, it, it's interesting, um, Vanguard was owned uh, by its clients. So our alignment, if you will, between our investors and our owners was 100%. Right. Um, but I remember being asked to do a talk, um, and this was probably right after the great financial crisis, to uh, Philadelphia, where, you know, where we're headquartered uh, in the Philly region, uh, the sort of the entrepreneurial ecosystem, there was a venture capital summit, and um, people uh, appropriately said that our founder, Jack Bogle, had created um, you know, one of the most memorable companies in, in, in the region and certainly one of the, the big success stories. And so the whole theme was, what got you there? And, and um, this is before the business roundtables, work mm -hmm. on governance and stakeholder debates with the Wall Street Journal and so forth. And um, the title of the talk was Serving the Three Cs. Um, our clients, our crew, and our community. Mm. And it was a pretty right. simple proposition. It was, you know, we believed in being great citizens in our communities because that's how we were going to attract really good people who became our crew members, which is our term for employee. And we believed you had to have great people in order to go execute on behalf of your clients, who was the third C. And our clients were also our investors. So again, we, we kind of got a twofer there. So for us, this whole concept of stakeholder engagement, if you will, it was never an either or, mm. it was a both and, right? You need, you, you need to take care of your consumers. You need to take care of your employees. You need to take care of the communities in which your employees live. And if you do that, we believe it leads to better business results. Um, I can't prove that. Um, I've combed the academic uh, fields for that. And you know, different people have done different um, types of work there. There's no conclusive evidence, but you know our track record was pretty solid and we believe that this approach actually had a lot to do with it. Well, I think you've redefined active management. Uh, the active management was around engaging the crew that could serve the clients and the community in ways that were game-changing uh, and I think transformed an in industry and, and a service to the American public and to the world to think about indexing and being engaged in, in owning equities. When you think about the, the role of a new CEO, one of the topics that we cover in the academy will be to think about, let's say you've been shortlisted and you're among that elite few inside who've been tapped to test your skills and think about whether we as a board should select you to, to become the chief executive. I thought about something from your amazing book here on talent that was very instructive in that use case, in addition to how you're training boards to think more expansively about this topic. And it, it came down to understanding your owners. And you've, you've addressed some of that here because we are the owners. Uh, we are all one community. And I think it's easy often to, to say, you know, I'm working for the long term. There's a kind of a morality play sometimes uh, that I hear in the C-suite about, well, yeah. we're trying to do what's right for shareholders. They just want to make a quick buck. And yet the truth of the matter is you're really talking about a permanence 
of this ecosystem in ways that often we don't hear about. Could you comment on that, that this distinction for that new entry? Yeah, yeah you know, so I, I, I think it's a great question and a, and a great point you make. Um, and it's it's something that changed a lot during the course of my career. Um, I bet. You know, if, if you go back to the 60s, you know, 90% of um, market cap of the U.S. was owned by individual investors directly. Right. And then there became the, the rise of mutual funds and, you know, investors rather than investing in equities directly, you know, used funds. And the predominant um, way that that was done was through active management where, you know, managers were making bets um, on specific companies within the um, broad mar markets as to who was going to outperform and who was going to underperform and so forth. And then um, our founder, Jack Bogle, had this idea of taking um, a sort of new and emerging technology around indexing, which was just starting to find its way in the pension world. And let's apply this to everybody. And that's mm -hmm. when we created the first index fund. And, and you know, as you may recall in those early days, um, well, you, you may not be old enough, but I, I certainly recall this. Um, the debate was very intense about the role of active versus index. And, right. um, you know, what's happened, of course, over time is indexing has become more prevalent because, you know, in the, in the long run, it has outperformed uh, the vast majority of active managers. So much more money has flowed uh, to it. I give you this all as context because the impact of that was to change the ownership structure of corporate America. Mm -hmm. um, you know, today, if you add up the primary index providers, it would be State Street, Vanguard, BlackRock, Northern Trust, Fidelity has a big um, index, Schwab. Yep. And there's probably three or four others. So, you know, you take your 10 or so firms that, you know, have uh, significant index um, capabilities, collectively, we own about 25% of every company in America. That is essentially permanent capital because at the end of the day, as an index fund manager, you can't sell a stock because you don't like what the company is doing. You actually have to own that stock. So you try to exert your influence, you know, through governance, the election of directors and so forth. But what this means for companies is all of a sudden there's a voice in the ownership structure that is very long-term oriented. Mm. And without you know being too disparaging, um, you traditional active management, many managers used to talk about were long-term investors. But if you looked at the statistics, you know, the average turnover of an active equity portfolio manager was around 80%, which means yeah. the holding period was less than two years. Yeah. So and then if you throw in activist hedge funds and so forth who had much shorter time frames, there's this, um, you know, uh, tension, if you will, between long term investors and short term and managements and boards were often caught in between. I would never suggest and some of my, you know, some of my peers might take a different view of this. I would never suggest that an act, a, a short term activist or active oriented manager has no voice. They, they should, you know, but it should be reflective of the percentage that they own in the company, not some outsized um, amount because of their loud voice or whatever. And, you know, and likewise, you know, we as longer term shareholders, we should have a, a voice that's um, consistent with our ownership, but not more, but not less. And that's really been the evolution in the last you know decade. And so, you know, when you go inside of boardrooms now and you talk about long term versus short term, you know, to me, again, it's very similar to what we talked about with stakeholders. It's not either or. You have to pay attention to the short run because the long run is, in essence, made up of a lot of short runs. But <laughs> what we don't want to see it, as a long term investor is decisions made that might benefit the short term at the expense of the long term. Right. And so that's, you know, in a sense, what you're asking boards to think about, um, you know, if you're if you're a Vanguard or a BlackRock or a State Street or anybody who has that index um, perspective. That's a, a brilliant way to think about it. And it's reassuring, you know, it's a genius of the end rather than the tyranny of the or. Uh, and when you think about the often adversarial relationship between investors and uh, management, particularly as it relates to the rise of activism, 
Um, you, you point out in your book, and, and I would agree wholeheartedly about how sometimes uh, activism can be quite activating. Maybe it's a necessity uh, to be called uh, to think more considerate, uh, considerately about your portfolio, about your strategy, about growth and, and those questions. Could you talk about what your advice is uh, for the chief executive or the, or the person on the way in to, to think about that, that kind of natural tension? Yeah. So, you know, um, it, 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 it's it's a really important point. Um, you know, first of all, the term activist covers such a wide range of investors. Now, it's, you got to be careful not to, you know, in a sense, put people in too broad a bucket. Right. But we, we have found, um, you know, just sort of studying the range of activist investors that there's a number of investors who um, I, I would argue are brilliant in terms of assessing problems inside of companies and either a bloated cost structure or um, business units that maybe don't have the synergies that uh, people expect they should or a flawed go-to-market strategy. I mean, there can be any host of these um, issues. Sometimes the diagnosis of the problem is really accurate, but the solution offered is not necessarily one that we think is, mm -hmm. is necessarily um, prudent. And that's where you'll see some of that tension. Mm -hmm. But make, you know, make no mistake, many of the insights that uh, th this group of investors make are really thoughtful and um, can be very much on the money. So we're always really interested um, from a governance standpoint, how boards are actually thinking about it. And you know, one of the phrases in our book um, that we really tried to underscore was, um, imagine that you have an activist in the boardroom, think like, like one. And you know, some of the best boardrooms I've been in have actually brought in activist investors who don't have a stake in the company to just talk to the board about if, they were to look at the company, how would they view it? Um, and you know, where would they be critical? It could be an incredibly um, unnerving <laughs> exercise. I love it. But on the other hand, it it can actually lead to real insights because again, um, you know, one of the things that I like about um, the way certain activists think is they've taken some of the best techniques from the private markets mm. and applied them to the public markets. Um, and again, I've spent you know the last uh, six six or seven years now, um, you know, post Vanguard, uh, spending more time in the in the private markets, you know, um, learning venture capital, learning private equity. These are things I did not really know well, you know, except from an academic perspective, um, you know, through the course of my career. And it's been really enlightening. And you know, one of the the sort of toolkits that you know many of the private investors will talk a lot about are the what they call their so called value creation plans. You know where they look at the the big levers a company has to pull in order to create more value for the owners. What you see with a lot of the best activists is they bring that same kind of tool set to a public company. Yes. And again, um, sometimes the solutions that they'll proffer after diagnosing the problem, you know, we, we there were times when we would disagree. There were also times when we completely agreed. And you know the and and actually our voting record. Record, um, with a number of the activists, I, I, I can remember having one of them say to me, well, you always vote against us. I said, actually, it's not true. Um, you know, we voted with you here and here. We disagreed with you here. Um, and, you know, what I found is each case is very idiosyncratic and you've got to really look at it very specifically. But there, there, there's been great value. Um, I think the activists have created a tremendous sensibility among um, especially larger to mid-sized public companies about issues they ought to be thinking about, you know, boards ought to be thinking about in terms of really creating long-term value for the uh, ultimate owners. I can't think of a better way to kind of unlock our resistance uh, to hearing and seeing what we may not want to. That's the inconvenient truth might come from the reality that an activist could be asking that question. Here she is. Uh, and here he is, and they're asking you the question. I used to do the same thing as a chief customer uh, advocate and experience officer at Schwab. It was uh, it was humiliating, humiliating to bring the uh, client in and the product managers to see how much we made a client suffer through our website. Uh, they'd be screaming on the other side of the two way mirror, saying, "No, it's over there, you idiot!" Well, uh, who's the you, you know, it's so interesting you bring that up because. Um... 
you know, one of my first roles at Vanguard was to work on, you know, running the um, distribution arm, if you will, right. just beginning 401k business. And um, one of the, the first things we did as a team is create a client um, advisory board. And right. we brought in 10 client advisors three times a year. And, you know, I put our team and sometimes, you know, the CEO or um, president of the firm in the room. And, you know, you think the world was ending. Um, <laughs> we thought we were doing a pretty it's good our job. customer and you're upset. But <laughs> I, I will tell you, we learned so much from that group. And mm -hmm. what we found over time was you, you could actually deepen the relationship by getting mm -hmm. those contrary viewpoints, in, in, you know, and addressing them head on. I, I love the through line here. I hadn't connected those dots before, Bill, about the activist is a, is a frame of mind and it could flow it's through brilliant. customers. It could throw through this, can we continue to be self-aware enough that we can learn and we can yeah. hear how the world has changed in ways that might be inconvenient to us. When you think about the, that big range now on activism between the those who are being constructive and end up being a good creative challenge, and those who end up being kind of destructive or elbowing themselves into the the board in a tough way, what what's your advice there? As you as you're now observer on the private and the public side in terms of how to manage. You know, I I think um, boards, you know, for historically boards relied on management and the management's investor relations team to you know right. to foster engagement with the shareholders. Right. I actually I actually think. Um, you know, what we see now are our cutting edge boards have voices with the investors. Um, mm. You know, again, I, I don't know what the latest data at Vanguard are, but um, my last couple of years, we probably averaged a thousand engagements a year with portfolio companies where we would sit down and more than wow. half of those were with some subset of the board. Um, you know, you didn't want to meet the whole board, but you it, it sure. was great to meet the lead independent director or if you had a separate chair from the CEO along right. with the CEO. Right. And we would probe around governance practices and committee structures and board composition and things like that to really help us assess whether the board was doing its job um, in terms of um, overseeing the company. And to get to your question, um, that kind of engagement should occur well before an activist shows up. Um, and if you have the, the kind of relationship with um, uh, between you know key board members and and key investors that that they at least know each other, they know each other's perspectives. I think it can be very helpful when that loud um, voice you know, maybe tries to force its way in, uh, perhaps inappropriately in some cases. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember one situation um, without naming names where we were pretty compelled by part of the case that an activist was making in terms of what was wrong with a particular company. And um, they were proposing a couple of uh, new board members and uh, the company proactively went out and brought in a couple of new board members, different than the ones that the activists wanted, but um, very, very capable people. And one in particular, we knew very well. And this individual reached out to us and said, give us a year. It will be very disruptive to have them in the boardroom uh, in the short run, we think we know where we're going. We don't disagree with some of the diagnostics that have been performed by the activists, but give mm. us a year. And um, so Brilliant. we agreed with that board, if you will. And the activist was not happy about this. And, but at the end of the year, um, the board actually reached out to the activists. And actually, I think one of the activist members, you know, one of the activist investors became a member of the board. And the company, you know, prospered. And I remember talking to the activists afterwards. They said, see, we were right. I said, no, actually, we were right, too, because we gave them the year. They did the right thing. And now everybody is better off. Um, and so sometimes it's, you know, it, it can be that subtle, if you will. Um, yeah, that was and, a navigation of the you know, schedule think, and, the, and yeah, some I, of the I content the board, prompted by great advice. Yeah. And, and, and again, 
this board engagement we'd had with this particular um, uh, new board member, he, this individual was somebody we knew from prior experiences and had a relationship with. And the, this individual knew it was appropriate to reach out to us um, as a long-term investor and have the discussion about what they were doing from a governance standpoint. So again, um, I, I don't want to over oversell an anecdote, but it was a, a great example of how this is supposed to work. It doesn't always come out that way. No. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I, I can imagine what you're describing is a, a framework where it, it can often be true on the sell side uh, analysts as well, but it's particularly true with the, with an activist um, or some institutional investors otherwise, which is they need to go, they need to prosecute what they think are the vulnerabilities of the yeah. company. Exactly uh, right. And uh, and when you think about that, what would you say are the areas where, um, and I know this is anecdotal, but if you were just to, as, as instruction, as we think about the academy, what would be the few areas where you think um, the, the biggest learning comes from? One of them ends up being around clients, uh, as you mentioned. What would be some of the, the areas that you'd tick off on your list that that we've learned from that kind of challenge that would be healthy to anticipate? Well, I, I think um, probably the number one issue that comes up is the inadequate talent in this on the C-suite mm. team. Uh, yeah, and you know, uh, some some of the crit, uh, critiques will be, um, I think, actually well founded in that area, and it's it's a reminder to board, both the board and you know the CEO in particular that you need to be really always thinking about talent um that's probably by a you know by a pretty big factor the the number one thing you see you know the, the second thing you do see is um lack of clarity around strategy um mm -hmm. and you know that it sounds so basic and it's hard to imagine that a you know Fortune 1000 company or a Fortune 500 company can have lack of clarity around strategy, but sometimes it's so convoluted and so complicated that if you yes. really put employees on truth serum, they can't tell you what it is. And when you hear it, it's so, you, you look at it and you go, wait a minute, like if I really dissect this, it's a lot of words, but it's not actually pointing out what, what are the, you know, what really gives you as an organization a distinct competitive advantage. Right. You know, one of the tricks for me, um, Mark, and again, this is going to sound overly simplistic to your audience because, you know, you got a lot of very sophisticated leaders there. I always I always start with um, asking, um, you know, when I look at mission statements of companies, um, focusing on do they talk about how and what or do they actually talk about why the company has a right to exist? Mm -hmm. and that why to me is very important. And, you know, you start with that why. And then what I want to hear is I want to hear a strategy that actually reinforces that. Like, tell me the things you're going to do to make that why a reality. So again, I'll use Vanguard as a really simple example. You know, we had a pretty long, complex mission statement when I first got to the company and, <laughs> um, you know, it was very flowery and uh, um, it, 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 it was really activated. Our founder was so good at activating elements of it that, the fact that it wasn't as crisp didn't really matter. Um, yeah. Later on, though, we you know we put a team together and we said, boil it down, and 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 we really underscored the 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 why. And actually, we brought in Simon Sinek. Uh, oh, perfect! Yeah, the book was groundbreaking on this to talk to the leadership team and to to really inspire people. And we did a cross sectional. You know, it was people sponsored from the C-suite, but all the way down to frontline management. And what the team came back to us with was Vanguard exists to take a stand for investors, treat them fairly, and give them the best chance for investment success. Really clear. And, you know, at the end of the day, oh, then we got into, you know, what do we do distinctively differently than everybody else that makes that true? And then, you know, what themes were we going to pursue in order to make, you know, you know, in order to really um, make a business from this? And, mm -hmm. um, you know, to me, that kind of clarity is not always apparent. And 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 again, I I think some of the activists are great at going 
in there and they probe with management and they get these very long convoluted strategies with all kinds of stuff. And, you know, you look for simple outcomes and you can't find them. So. I love that because you're, you're finding yet again, another uh, dimension of accountability, because yeah. if you are forced to simplify it and to penetrate what might be obscure or opaque uh, in the why, uh, and then you have to honor it. Then you have to live up to those expectations. You do. And, and you know, for us, um, you know, we, like everybody in, in the business, you know, we had balanced scorecards with all kinds of KPIs and whatnot. Of course. But, um, right. I, I had a, a great young crew member at one point ask me during a town hall when we were sort of rolling some of this out, like, I, I, you know, these it, scorecards pretty complicated and there's a lot of stuff there. Like, what's it really boil down to? And um, what really is going to tell us whether we're successful or not? Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was a great question. And um, we pondered it. We came back and, and we had four metrics um, at the end of the day. And I mean, we had thousands of metrics because we're- Right, investors. they had we to did. roll up to something, right? But we had four metrics that really mattered that we shared with the whole company all the time. Um, the first one was actually around employee engagement. Um, Excellent. We, we believed, again, going back to the, our prior comments, we didn't have great people. We would not have great service and great product. So we had an employee engagement number. We then had a fund performance number. Um, that's what we did. And, and, you know, the indexing being a huge part of it, but we basically, our goal was over a 10 year period that 90% of our funds would beat their peers, which was kind of breathtaking. And people were, but we thought the math- Oh, that's big, hairy, audacious goal, Jim Collins. <laughs> we, but we, we thought the math actually supported it. Um, mm -hmm. Then we had a client loyalty. Um, uh, we used that promoter score, but there are a lot of different ways you could cut that. Sure. And then right. we had, you know, Vanguard, because it's owned by its clients, didn't have a, a, a straight line profitability um, number the way most companies do, but we had our version of financial um, accountability and it was our expense ratio. Um, mm. Yes. So we set these four numbers out with over the next 10 years. These are what these numbers, th these are where we're going. And it was incredibly clear. Like, and yeah, there's a lot of other stuff. Um, people were like, well, where's market share? Where's growth? Like, and, you know, our, our view was you have really great people with surreal investment performance, the lo most loyal clients in the industry. And the financial promise we made, we're going to do it for half the price over the next 10 years of what we currently charge. Mm. We, we figured we'd have plenty of market share, plenty of cash flow, plenty of <laughs> all the other stuff. Right. You'd be stealing market share or you'd be actually creating a larger market, which right. I felt you did both. You challenged the rest of us in the industry to have expense ratios that would be legendary, second to none. On the one hand, on the other hand, you made more access available because of those economics, I think to more players and types of investors. But it was, you know, it's back to, it, that's that's exactly right. But, it, you know, it, 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 you know, these concepts tie back right to your question though, around, yes, exactly. you know, so a lot of companies that, that we encountered, you know, and, and you know, I've been in a lot of boardrooms now, um, you know, as either representing Vanguard or, you know, post Vanguard. Right. And you don't always see that clarity. Um, and, 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 you know, and, you know, companies who do, you know, they, they're trying really hard, they do some really good things, but the, 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 the clarity that you have to have to be successful, I think is something that, again, you know, next to people is probably the second thing that we, we see. That makes so much sense. When, when I reflect on the number of times, it's easy to have such an insular conversation in a boardroom or in a C-suite. We've all convinced each other that that two-page vision statement somehow resonates for everyone. <laughs> and it often does take an outsider. And of course, that should be part of the role of the board saying, could we ask why at least four or five times and, and really reveal and I, I, I think there's one other point, and it's it, it's somewhat tied to the talent. Um, I think the two are actually, um, yeah, I, I think they're more than correlated. I think it's causal. Um, mm. More companies fail due to lack of execution than lack of appropriate strategy. So despite what I just said, um, you know, the execution <laughs> thing is really a, a, a big thing to pay attention to. And again, when you look at 
you know, activist campaigns, a lot of times that's where they, they're, you know, they're, that's where they start. But again, you know, my view is it's usually, there's usually a talent component to that um, sure. around execution. I, I, it's hard for me to imagine that the, the there, there's not actually pretty close um, relationship there, but um, that, that can be a real signal though. Um, that can be a real signal. That's a great point. I was talking to Ram doing the same program with him on Monday, your co-author and our good friend and legendary management thinker. And he was talking about kind of execution eating strategy for breakfast. Uh, and in terms of we still have to get it done. And the only way we can is to your point, we have to have that A team. Uh, and we have to always have that continuous pipeline so we can be moving them up uh, through the organization. And I, I wanted to take a few minutes to to focus just on that idea of succession, uh, if you have a moment. And that is, what do you wish you knew when you became chief executive uh, that you know today and reflect on probably frequently um, that uh, would have been helpful to know when you were starting out and stepping into the, the big corner office? Yeah, I, I think that it, it, it does come back to talent. Okay. Um, you know, the great Jim Collins asked me a question once. He said, if you look at your organization, your top leadership group, top couple hundred uh, in the company, we were a company of about 15,000 at the time. Yeah. So, you know, your top two to 300, what percentage of those key jobs are filled by A-plus leaders? Mm. I wish I had known to ask that question. Um, <laughs> we had a lot of great people. So, um, I, 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 you know, but that bar... That bar, you know, when you when you talk about A plus leaders, and you know, yet you have to first of all you have to sort of define what that is. But for for us at least, it was somebody who was incredibly um, focused on our clients, incredibly focused on our people, um, could do the next job um, if if asked up the chain. So you know, tremendous promotability. So I could go on, but you know, we, yes. we got to what it was. He, you know, Jim would never give me a precise number, but he said, you ought to be thinking 75%, like, <laughs> yeah. you know, that, and, and I, I, you know, I thought I knew a lot, but I, I did not ask those, that, that hard of question. I did not have the bar set high enough, and I wish I had, because um, it is everything. And, you know, it's interesting. I'm involved with a lot of um, younger companies now, some, some of startups. Course. Right. And, you know, I'm always pushing them on, you know, the level of talent that they have. And, you know, you'll get the pushback, hey, you know, we're, we've got 50 people in our company or we got 100 people. Like, you know, not exactly. everybody wants to come to a, a company this small. Right. But we use the term over club, right? Like, you know, like exactly. if you think you need this, go for this. Um, right. Look for somebody um, uh, who, who's got a little bit more runway. And it's, made a huge difference. And, and and again, you know, I knew pieces of that at Vanguard, but I hadn't thought about it systematically. You know, it 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 makes so much sense. And it also would have been kind of iconoclastic when you come into an organization, you you think about breaking glass um, and and really what it means in terms of moving around people who might be also the right people for that earlier season or that chapter of the business. It um, happens often out here. Um, I was part of the I guess I call it the labor pool of graduate students when Jim was writing Good to Great and uh, um, Built to Last. And I wrote the sequel, Success Built to Last. And uh, when we were thinking about trying to make the impact lasting, um, when you think about sustainable advantage, you mentioned a couple of sustainable advantages, only one of them ends up being very much about this accountability to change and being able to respond to customers and to activists and others and, and disrupting yourself. What else was a part of that, you think, that allowed you to have sustainable success as a CEO and as a company? Well, you know, I think you actually, you, you hit one of the key points. Um, and, I, and I was really lucky because I had, I had a great teacher in this. Um, I think great companies have to be in a continuous state of um, renewal and reinvention. Yeah. And our founder, Jack Bogle, his his favorite quote was um you know he he was a big shunter um you know the austrian economist oh. he's a huge fan of his 
And as you probably know, um, one of Schumpeter's sort of classic economic things was about creative destruction and right. how capitalism was, in a sense, creative destruction, right? Like a little Darwinian that way. Yeah. Yeah. New companies would come and 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 completely um, reinvent how something was done and displace um, you know existing competitors. You know, obviously Clay, Clay Christensen gave us sort of the late 20th century version of that um, in, right. in his work. But Jack loved to talk about it. And um, what it did for us as a company is it created a culture where you weren't afraid of that. So, you know, he basically, you know, was the creative destroyer, if you will, of our industry in a lot of ways, right? Like he came up with these novel concepts, whether it was Vanguard's ownership structure, the use of indexing for small investors, the the broad education of um, and democratization of investing, if you will, that he he championed. You know, his successor looked at it and said, you know, Vanguard's a virtual company before the term virtual is even used. And when oh, the that's true. beginnings of like a commercial internet began to emerge, he jumped on that. And we had been a company, you know, just like I can remember the speech Mr. Bogle gave about like he had a slide <laughs> table and he, he talked about how he, he he could challenge anybody on a PC to, you know, calculate as quickly as he could on his slide roll. <laughs> and um he, he was just trying to make the point that, you know, don't over rely, don't undersell human ingenuity and over rely on technology. Fair enough point. But his successor, Jack Brennan like went all in on Vanguard.com. And, you know, I, I, I happen to be, you know, working in the business unit that sort of brought the first idea forth and the basically reinvented, you know, how we serve clients. Right. Then, you know, for our generation, um, we had fooled around with this thing called an exchange traded fund, but we weren't really yeah. committed to it. Right. Again, our founder didn't like it. Um, you know, he, he thought they were um, trading vehicles. Our chief investment officer, though, kept saying, "Don't they don't have to be. Like, there's a way right. to do this. You can have a Vanguard value proposition. You can. And so we went all in on that coming out of the GFC. Let's all, and, and basically, if you think about Vanguard today, my successors have done a great job with this huge business in ETFs, you know, largest domestic ETF provider now. Um, no, the biggest. In, in, the, in the country, yeah. second largest in the world. Um, we serve tens of millions of people that we never served before through financial advisors because they use our ETFs and our education and, and our funds too. But, you know, I could argue that 65% of Vanguard today didn't exist 15 years ago mm. and it, in a sense it was part of the reinvention um and they're they've got some really cool stuff that they're working on now you know you've probably seen vanguard's advisory services where we exactly you know, the personal advisory service yeah i i haven't checked in with the team in the last month or two but you know it was uh, half a trillion dollars and yeah. 500 right. billion dollars and six hundred thousand people that we are serving and again, in my day, when I first joined the company, we were trained how not to give advice, right? Like, right, exactly. It was, it was all a do it yourself concept. And, and now Same. today, we're like, we can do this better than anybody else and at a better price point. And we're seeing massive, you know, um, interest in it. And again, it's a pretty big reinvention of the company. But if you go back to that, why? <laughs> yeah, it's a, it it's actually a doesn't investment. contradict anything in the not why. We're still right. taking a stand, still treating people really well. And we think the way we do advice gives them a better chance of superior outcomes. Yeah. So, absolutely. you know, it, it all sort of fits. Um, it does fit. And I think and that, reinvention, the, that the reinvention thing is really important. Yeah, it, it really truly has been. And, and you in drawing a distinction to bring it back to the first principles of those four that were your goals that were advocates for the customer and for the individual investor in addition to the other investor groups is, is brilliant. I, I had the privilege of working with Chuck Schwab on schwab.com. I was chief executive there when we had to do the first clicks and bricks. And yep. uh, we were thinking, my goodness, well, we don't wanna violate all the rules as we're seeing it in the online world. Well, no, let's do it our way. Let's do it with integrity. Let's, uh, let's do it 
in a way that uh, we did the same with the financial advisor service, which we also wanted to avoid. Uh, and then we realized we could be white labeling services as long as we did it once again with the platform of integrity around fee based services as opposed to commission churn based right, which, which again you know again i i think I, I think what chuck did and what schwab did is an entity again great ex another great example of a company that kept reinventing itself um, based on first principles ironically right 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 absolutely um but you know i i look at schwab as a um co-conspirator with vanguard yes I, in there too, um, in terms sure. of the three firms probably did more to democratize investing than yes. the other 10,000 that exist. And Absolutely. we all approached it differently. Yes. Different value propositions and, um, and again, different levels of success depending on which, you know, particular part of the ecosystem you look at. But uh, the one thing that was true about each of the companies, interestingly, yes. I hadn't really thought about it until you asked the question. All three companies have reinvented themselves pretty dramatically yes. over time. Um, you know, right. Ned Johnson, you know, took it over from his father. Yeah, and, and Abigail. Dramatically in terms of what he did with technology. And, you know, I think the current leadership team has done has done the same thing. So again, it's, it's interesting. And, and there just aren't that many companies who've been successful at doing that over and over and over again. It's hard to do. And, you know, in the, in the, uh, it's interesting if you go back to Collins is built the last, that, that element wasn't really, a, didn't jump out as much um, in the, in, oh. the, in the four things that made companies great. It, it, it's there, but I, I've become pretty convinced that it is the distinctive quality that you really need to get right. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. When you think about that, then in the framework of kind of the inverse question, which is I asked you kind of what you wish you knew at the beginning that was significant that you know today, what would you say now looking back over that time and, and also now helping some of those younger recruits in new companies, what's almost entirely different or what's fundamentally different in ways that we need to be sensitive to from the time, from the turn of the century to, to yeah. present in terms of the the course of CEO's trajectory? Well, you know, I, I, I think a lot of, so look, talent, you know, continues like- Always. Yeah, always. Like, so just be- More agile than ever. <laughs> yeah, just be super aggressive there. You know, I think the nature of strategy and strategic planning and thinking has shifted quite a bit. You know, when people say things feel like they're moving more quickly today than they were, they're actually right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, if you think about Moore's Law, and right. it's back that business, you know, we're an understatement. <laughs> not at the beginning of that, you know, curve. Like we're, we're working our way up, and so things are accelerating at an exponential level. Mm. And I think you know, leadership teams need while they can have first principles, they can have sort of longer term aspirations. They've got to actually be really agile in terms of how they're going to achieve those um, those results. And you can end up pivoting quite a bit um, mm -hmm. in terms of you know what you're actually doing. Right. This is something I think that the you know the venture back world you know out where you are, um, Sandhill figured out. And you know one of the things we did as a leadership team is we spent time with the, the VCs and the lean startup folks. Um, and you know yes. when yeah, you know, this is back in like ten years ago now when lean sure. startup was sort of a new thing. Yeah. And the idea of being agile strategically um, without, you, know, you you have to find that right balance. What you don't want to be is um, frenetic and just constantly right. changing what you're doing. But right. you've got to be open to the shift in the exogenous factors out there. Um, you know, COVID is a great example recently, right? No one had COVID as a, as a big risk. And you, 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 whatever your business strategy was going into COVID, you had to pivot and you had to pivot quickly and you had to figure out how you were going to achieve your longer term aspirations. It could be very different than what you thought. Mm -hmm. My generation went through that with GFC, um, the great financial right. crisis. Right. We had a whole set of assumptions going in about what we thought were the big strategic imperatives for Vanguard. Not one of them mattered um, when we, <laughs> as we went through that crisis. Like it was something <laughs> we thought we were going to have to get better at. And, but, you know, the, the principles of what the firm stood for hadn't changed, but right. what we did to sort of achieve those changed very dramatically. So this Great strategic point. 
flexibility is really key. And I think, by the way, it plays all the way up through the board. Yeah. Um, boards have to be thinking, how do we govern this and how do we, in a sense, ensure our managements are agile enough? Um, one of the things that, you know, I'm you know, seeing a very healthy evolution around is the amount of time set, spent on strategy in board meetings is gone, is up dramatically, at least especially in the board meetings I'm in. Um, yes. Every yes. board meeting is, there's a deep dive on some element of our strategy. Um, and doesn't mean we're changing all the time, but man, we are examining or re-examining and testing. And if we have to pivot, yes challenge whatever um we're, we're we're trying to do it that's um that i think is a very deep insight both the the speed and the urgency together with the agility around the strategy rather than the changing of the values but the willingness to continue to update i guess that's part of what the customer and the activist might be doing as well as just making sure you're up to date on what matters uh in their world because they're fiduciaries too of of capital could I just ask as a closing, a, a more personal question and, and, and think about why you do this? I mean, you've had this extraordinary career presided over a company that's been able to be agile and live by its values. And now you're continuing to pay it forward in the work that you're doing with the CEO Academy and the work that you're doing with these startups and so forth. Could you tell me why this matters so much? What's What gives us the most meaning for the work that you're doing? Yeah, um, you know, I'm going to sound a little Pollyannish here. But Please. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, um, with all the problems out there in the world, I yeah. still believe that um, capitalism is a fundamentally better economic system than anything else. Mm. And that great companies provide great opportunities for people and at a scale that no other thing can. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you can make it function better, and more effectively, um, I think that's you know what we you know what we're each called to do. Um, and I think there are a couple of different ways people can go about this. Um, you know, I've got you know friends and peers who are, are kind of operating at a policy level and trying sure. to ship things gradually that way. I think that's great. Um, One I'm way to do it that way. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm not good at that. Like you, know, you got to know what you're good at, right? Like it, you know. It, I love the idea of going in, finding a company that can make a difference in its sector and, you know, change the way people think about the sector. Mm -hmm. And then what happens is if you're successful, people are forced to copy what you do at some element. They try to put their own spin on it. But, right. you know, again, I, I and I say this with all humility aside, like, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't want this to sound arrogant, but I don't think Fidelity should. Schwab, BlackRock, any of the, any of our competitors are, you know, happy to be reducing fees on ETFs and index funds just on a regular <laughs> consistent basis. Like, I think because they had to compete with us, they actually sharpened their that. pencils, figured yeah. out, um, yeah. you know, Vanguard's onto something here, and you know, you know, we we have to react accordingly. So in a sense, our impact as a company is much greater than our customer base. It's, you know, For we're affecting sure. other people's customer bases. And I, you know, we feel good about that. Like I, I think that's a good thing. You know, I'm on the United Healthcare Board. Um there you go. If we're successful in promoting value-based care and um the the way we think about healthcare, we will bend the cost curve on healthcare eventually wow. more effectively than anybody else. That could be life changing for Americans. It can, and it's it's a huge, daunting task. But when you look at what the company has achieved so far, um, yeah. there are elements of it there, and you know, I'm so I you get really, really excited about the opportunity to be involved in that. You know, one of my startups close to um, your heart, uh, your original heart at Schwab. You know, we're a 21st century, digitally enabled, very high tech custodian platform for advisors like oh very cool take you know take what Schwab and Fidelity have been doing for decades but put it in like very modern technology with you know none of the legacy issues wow fantastic and 
it's a company that, again, if we're successful um, and we're having a lot of success uh, so far, will help rewrite what's possible in the um, advisor space. You know, we will make advisors more effective. That's going to that's going to impact millions of investors. So again, it's another way to do that. So these are those are wow. you know, they're all simple examples, and you know there's a handful of other things that you know you, I'm trying to get involved in like that. But for me, it's that that constant. You know, again, if these companies are successful, consumers are better off, the world therefore is better off, employees are better off. You've got great jobs. You know, it all sort of reinforces itself. It is. And it's um, that contribution you're making, as you said, expands many, many, many multiples beyond an existing individual company. It ends up being a role model and an influence, just as you are personally, Bill. Thank you for the contribution you made. And we certainly appreciate your partnership. Well, thank you. And and, and again, uh, privileged to be here. You know, as I, I, I should have said right up front, you know, the, the most important most important element for most of us, at least, is it's better to be lucky than smart. And uh, <laughs> I you think know, you're probably right place, right time, and uh, great, you know, great support systems and so forth. But uh, you know, I, you know, I, I've known you, your colleagues, for a long time. They've been very influential in terms of how you know I, I've thought about things. And again, you know, sometimes you got to you got to make sure you always reflect. There's there's a certain amount of luck in this world that um, you know when you have it, you better take advantage of it. That's for sure. That that sense of gratitude that you're expressing there is, is, is kind of the through line to the way you're paying it forward. So Bill, thank you for this time and I appreciate it. Would look forward to other chapters in this conversation that are prompted both by what you did in this, uh, you know, in, in this extraordinary book and the career for which a lot of these principles came. So thanks again for being here, Bill. Oh, you're welcome, Mark. Thank you for having me.